we're recording. Okay, uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Uh, today is September 24th, 2021. It is 11 a.m. and I'm calling this meeting to order. So this is the third of our weekly wrap-up meetings where the Cannabis Board reviews the work of the advisory committee and the subcommittees, um, has an open discussion about their progress and the direction that we'd like them to go, and, um, and we can kind of just think about any other issues that we would like them to address. Um, the subcommittees have continued to meet at their breakneck pace. Um, they made a lot of progress this week. Um, including they voted on some very specific recommendations um, from the subcommittees. Um, we're trying to schedule our first full advisory committee meeting. I think I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and um, that will give the advisory committee an, an option to kind of get input and weigh in on the subcommittee process and the work that they've done. Um, and that means I think for our benefit, um, we will have some things that we can actually vote on and recommend um, ourselves as a cannabis board next for next Friday's meeting. So I don't want to bury the lead here. I think um, anyone who's been paying attention knows that um, we're likely not to hit our October 1st reporting uh, requirement. You know, the um, given the pace of decision making and the amount of consideration that goes into developing a fee structure and the need to kind of have a little bit of process equity and receive appropriate feedback from our advisory committee and the public. I'd say that we're about two weeks behind schedule. Um, I think we all recognized when we started this process that uh, the subcommittee structure, advisory committee structure was on an aggressive timeline. Um, and that given just the significance of this report to all the people that are watching and want to participate in this market, and given the fact that we want to be clear about grounding our fee structure and our market structure in equity and accessibility to small cultivators, um, that I think that there's just a few more decision points that we want fully vetted, um, and we don't want to rush. Um, I don't think actually that this impacts our timelines. Um, uh, I think that, um, you know, again, this report is a recommendation to the legislature, and the legislature um, needs to act upon it before we can um, adopt it or before we can you know, work on it. So um, I think we have an October 15th report due on social equity criteria, and I think we could probably um, put these two together and submit them on the 15th. Um, yeah, so I don't see much uh, impact on our future deadlines or our future reports um, based on this delay. Um, I very much appreciate all of the members of our advisory committee um, who volunteered at this point countless hours of their time to this endeavor. I certainly appreciate all the members of the public who've traveled from all around the state uh, to attend these subcommittee meetings and have their voices be heard. And uh, I appreciate all the people that have submitted comment, um, both at these meetings and through our website. Um, on this last point, we are gonna be holding monthly, after hours, cannabis board meetings dedicated exclusively to public comment. Um, these will be one hour meetings from six to 7 p.m. The physical location will be our offices um, at 89 Main Street in Montpelier. Um, but these will also be live streamed um, and members of the public can attend and comment um, through Microsoft Teams through the link that will be available on our website. Um, the board members intend to stay for the full hour. Um, so, you know, if you get off work and you can't join right at six o'clock, we'll be there until seven. Um, however, if there is no public comment, then um, the board members can, I feel, fine letting you turn your videos off, but there will be someone present um, here at our office. We'll post the dates to our websites for, for this, but the first one is this coming Tuesday, um, September 28th from 6 to 7 p.m. The next one will be October 26th, um, November 30th, and then December 28th. So we're trying to do the kind of like the last Tuesday of each month. 
Um, that's the schedule for the rest of the year, and we'll update that um, for the next year. So the advisory committee um, will be meeting in full next week, uh, next Wednesday, uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. And they're going to review and provide input on the subcommittee's uh, work. Um, the in-person location will be at 89 Main Street, um, third floor at the Department of Financial Regulation conference room. Um, but for those meetings, of course, members of the public may attend virtually through a Teams link that we'll have on our website, and there'll be a, an agenda posted to our website as well. And of course, there'll be a public comment period. Um, I guess the last thing I have is everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes from our prior cannabis board meeting last Friday. Yes. Great. Uh, I take a motion to approve those minutes. Uh, so moved. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, that's the last of the kind of administrative details. Um, Kyle, do you want to do an update on sustainability and then the compliance enforcement? Sure. Um, so one of one thing that was explicitly mentioned in 164 was was ensuring that the cannabis control board look to our state agency partners to leverage partnerships where it is appropriate, and I would say that that was a big theme for both the Sustainability Committee and the Compliance and Enforcement Committee this week. I'll start with sustainability. Uh, we met on Wednesday for 90 minutes instead of um, Monday and Thursday for 60 minutes um, due to scheduling conflicts um, and the substance that we were reviewing. It, was just, it made more sense to have one longer meeting and we reviewed um, PSD's energy recommendations. I thought overall um, the conversation a very technical, very in the weeds, um, but at the end of the day, um, I think the consultant, um, Jacob Blitzer, and, and also members of the subcommittee were overall very impressed with PSD's recommendations. Um, even considering that uh, PSD is, is wading into waters that they typically haven't um, had um, authority over, namely greenhouses. Those are typically exempt, exempt from the commercial building energy standards and handled through the Agency of Agriculture. Um, we're working on a little bit of uh, making sure they have the statutory authority to to help us if if enforcement is ever necessary from those outdoor uh, greenhouse is and, and those perspectives um, where we have we did not take a vote specifically on those recommendations I think uh, the subcommittee is in agreement almost with all of those recommendations but there's some thoughts that are that are still being reviewed and considered by our consultant to make sure that um, it's appropriate for this specific market. Um, he's got the cannabis energy expertise, just making sure that through his knowledge and outreach and materials that are available to him, um, the recommendations by PSD are something that will slide in and work for everybody who's trying to participate in this market. Um, so that's really where um, the entire focus came from the S Sustainability Committee this week. As for compliance and enforcement, we did make a lot of progress this week, um, overall, we talked a lot about um, local control. I think um, the subcommittee helped give Julie you some, some um, direction, some guidance on the municipal roundtable that I think is um, scheduled to happen next week. Mm -hmm. um, we also talked about outdoor cultivation enforcement and indoor cultivation enforcement, and the subcommittee voted unanimously to um, ask the board to look towards a memorandum of understanding with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets to assist us on inspection, compliance, and enforcement when it comes to outdoor cultivation and indoor cultivation. So that'll be presented to the, to the, full, sub, or the full advisory committee and potentially voted on by the board next week. Um, the other milestone that we hit in that committee um, this week was um, another charge, and I just want to make sure I have it up, on seed to sale tracking. We talked a lot about seed to sale tracking, what that means, the different types of technology that we could um, implement from a state level that will um, ensure that there's no diversion, that we have appropriate data that we need um, at our level, um, also for folks that will be license holders. Um, and we, um, the subcommittee, voted unanimously on a couple sentences that kind of give us as a board some guidance um, to go out and seek a vendor uh, to work with. And I can just read that for the, the better of the, the folks on the call and for you too. Um, the board shall seek a vendor for open API tracking software that is maintained by the Cannabis Control Board but is login accessible by cultivators to self-report inventory. Software should have the capacity to track data based on both 
lot size and plant count. So um, very 30,000 foot, not in the weeds there, but give us some um, starting point to go out and, and look uh, to a relationship with a vendor. What does API stand for? Um, I'm not a tech guy, <laughs> so <laughs> way I, I, I can look it, it up. Did right not, here. sorry. <laughs> um, can you give me one second? Um, the way I understand it is, is it's a communication tool between two different programs. Okay. So That's application awesome. programming interface. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Should have just, you know, not, <laughs> not gotten into in my head about it. But, but yeah, so it would, it would allow for us to have our platform, but a license holder to potentially go out and seek whichever software they want to use, okay. you know, considering what they want out of that software, price point, so on and so forth. But as long as it, it interfaces with our software, they'd have that ability to do so versus us uh, requiring a license holder to go out and seek a specific type of software. Essentially, that's the way I understand it, but I've learned a lot about um, software over the last week or so. So, um, We heard from um, the, the Department of Liquor and Lottery on retail enforcement. Um, yesterday, I thought that, that was a really good conversation. We're going to continue that conversation on Monday. Um, the Agency of Agriculture does, does have some experience in retail um, enforcement. I want to hear um, how they typically go about things. And um, we're going to hear about some, some states that really do all of that retail enforcement in-house and what that would take from a resource perspective um, from some of our consultants. So uh, that's kind of, unless I'm missing something, that's, that's where both of them stand. But um, again, the Sustainability Committee could, um, we'll be talking about waste primarily on Monday, but I asked Jacob to reserve some time to continue a conversation on those energy recommendations. and. Um, there's a, the, the potential for a vote at a subcommittee on those next week. Was there a discussion uh, in compliance and enforcement about the resources that uh, the agency of ag would need in order to do that? You know, I know they have what five people total. Yeah, you know, we've the, we've there hasn't been any definitive um, mm -hmm. answer to what that would need. Again, I think everybody's kind of waiting and seeing. Um, the recommendations from the market structure right. committee on um, license types, even understanding how many licenses we're going to expect as a board right. um, to be out there from both the cultivation and retail um, perspective. I, I think it's hard for us to estimate that at this point in time, but even getting that ballpark on what to expect, the size of specific operations, how many indoor versus outdoor will really help um, the Agency of Agriculture and uh, the Department of Liquor and Lottery. Yeah. I've asked the same question too, and they, of course, want to see how many retail establishments we would expect um, to yeah. be with us over the course of the next year or two. They estimate that there's over 7,000 um, license holders from a tobacco and alcohol perspective across the state. They have 11 inspectors, and they each carry about 60 to 70 um, license. They, they inspect 60 to 70 per inspector each year. Um, I don't think we're going to have 7,000 retail establishments, but um, it'll certainly add to their to their load. Um, yeah. And so, um, again, I think once we that sort of comes into vision from a market size and structure perspective, we can really start ironing out more resources that will be necessary, both in manpower and, and financial relationships with, uh, with yeah. whichever direction we go. And that 7,000, that's you know, liquor stores and also places that sell beer and wine? Or sure, just, yeah. Okay. Liquor so. stores, general stores, corner stores, gas breweries, gotcha. distilleries, gas stations. Yeah. And they said that number fluctuates, but that was a approximation. And then um, have they considered, or maybe it's something that should be on, at least on their radar, um, some of the alternative retail license types that have been discussed in the market structure, the delivery, um, the you know potential like limited space one or like store within a store. Sure, so I've signaled to that committee that the market structure committee might put forth a license type with a fee, recognizing that there's a lot more questions that would need yeah. to be answered before the board moves on any specific license type when it comes to the general store concept or mm -hmm. farm gate sales or delivery, so on and so forth. I think we're going to move out of the enforcement arena next week and into the security arena. And mm -hmm. what does what does that mean? Security is such a broad term when we relate 
to this industry, whether it's fencing at an outdoor cultivation site, what types of camera security would be needed at, an, at a retail establishment or an indoor growth site, so on and so forth. So uh, I've asked um, Bryn and our consultants to help us start um, attacking that in small chunks, that word security, and hopefully once we um, have more discussions, some of those thoughts and um, how practical some of those license types will be, at least at the initial phase, um, will sort of come into view. Yeah. So delivery would be entirely new, right? We don't have any alcohol delivery. And so a delivery inspection would be an entirely new, whereas, you know, like having, mm -hmm. you know, there are stores now that sell beer and wine or have, you know, cola food stores in them. That might be not a different process, but delivery would be a completely yeah. new process. Sure. It's just something to think about. Yeah, and I asked, you know, the Grand Lottery, um, they go in and, and do sting operations and inspect stores where folks under the age of 21 can be in regardless of what they're trying to purchase. They could go and buy candy, there might be liquor behind the counter or beer in the cooler. And I would imagine, it, 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 except for that general store concept, you know, that same type of underage interaction at a retail establishment for, at a dispensary is going to be a lot different. So how would their program um, look if if we were going to go in that direction and what would change from that tobacco and, and alcohol perspective yeah I'd like to get their perspective too also on the special event license types um, and how they um, how they handle those uh, you know like the Vermont Brewers Fest what their involvement for okay. in, in that kind of enforcement looks like that's a that's a great idea I'll make sure that I, I ask that question on Monday all right, anything else you need from us? I think we're good, I think we're making progress and we're trying to, to especially with the implant, Compliance and Enforcement Committee, it's, it's a lot on their plate and trying to figure out ways to yeah. gather small wins and take things and, and the ability to actually get something done in an hour. Um, it's challenging, but we're figuring out ways to get the most use out of their time and their feedback. Yeah. All right, Julie, do you wanna, just because of the, I mean, I sat in on social equity. You want to just do these one at a time, maybe start with public health and have a discussion and then social equity sure. and have a discussion? Um, so public health um, continued a lot of their discussion. They did not um, make any decisions or uh, um, fully agree on things just yet. Um, they are hoping to do that next week. So they continued to review symbols. Um, they discussed more about the warnings, um, talking about the addition of um, poison control to some of the warnings and not safe for children and, and you know whether or not it should say do not use if, if pregnant or breastfeeding. So that was a lot of their conversation um, around that. They also began to talk a little bit about how much of an ad space a warning should take up. Um, and they looked at a package that came from um, a legal dispensary in another state that had absolutely no warnings. Um, and then the moderator demonstrated what it would look like with warnings to kind of demonstrate the difference and the importance of these warnings. Um, and they've also talked about the, the possibility of having a QR code on packaging that could be scanned and provide additional either product information or safety information. Um, that is kind of the, the gist of their conversation for the week. Is there any benefit or is there any discussion around having a regional standard, you know, as in like uh, having a New England regional standard for some of these labeling, um, you know, requirements and I, and I just wonder if you know you have people that are traveling from Massachusetts or Maine to Vermont that they will understand kind of inherently what what our symbols mean. Yeah. So they did start by looking at the Mass and Maine mm -hmm. uh, labeling because both Mass and Maine use the same label. The one concern there was that the the leaf is a little bit um, cartoonish. It looks a little bit like a maple leaf. So there was a concern that it could be <laughs> confused in some way with actually marketing. Um, and then they also looked at some folks uh, that are doing international uh, standardization of symbols. And so I think that's what they're trying to decide between is the sort of international standard of symbols and a regional uh, you know, standard of symbols. Um, and that's what they're looking at. I think where they're going now is sort of a combination of the two. Yeah. I, I, it, it's curious to me because you know, this is a symbol that has to be on every product. And it could be actually because of Vermont's like dedication to quality and uh, you know 
it actually could be a stamp of kind of like a mm -hmm. stamp of something, a quality product as well. But I also wonder if there is federal legalization, whether or not, you know, we want, we're going to have to change the symbol anyway. If, right. So I kind of want to anticipate both of those yeah. issues. Um, and I think too, this committee is very concerned about um, whether or not a label says enough. And um, one of the concerns I have is the more we add to this, the more difficult it is for someone to put on their product. So the more colors you have, the, the more detailed the design, the more difficult it is for people to get that onto their product. Um, and the more expensive it is yeah, for someone to do that. Yeah, it be a financial right. burden for folks to comply, recognizing right. that this is in the name of consumer safety. Right. So it's a careful balance, I would imagine. Um, the other interesting thing that came up with the packaging that they looked at is that the package that they looked at had no, um, uh, serving size on it. So it was a package that had like 10 gummies in it, but it didn't say, it said how many milligrams of THC there were, but not how much is a serving size. So there was some concern around and some direction around making sure that our packaging has serving sizes on it. Great. Sounds good. Yeah. Are they looking like they're going to move towards any sort of vote or conclusion by next week or? I, I hope so. I think that um, there's so much to look at and there's so much consideration about the public health that there's a little bit of um, paralysis in the, in the analysis. And, but I think we're going to try and move towards a decision. Okay. I don't know how much this would impact our October 1 reports. It's not like, uh, you know, there's, there is time on this subcommittee okay. to do the work. Um, but, you know, eventually we'll have to file rules. Right. So. Yeah. Their charge is to be done by October 20th, so okay. they are working with that, okay. that sort of deadline in mind. Gotcha. Great. Anything for Julie? I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Um, social Equity did make some um, agreements on defining a Social Equity candidate, which they um, defined as lives in an Opportunity Zone, which is a criteria that's defined by the U.S. Census, um, or is Black, Indigenous, or a person of color or convicted of cannabis-related offense, or has a family member who's been convicted of a, a cannabis-related offense. And that could include an arrest, um, a misdemeanor, or a felony. There's, there's a, a list of those offenses. Um, they also agreed to a definition of impacted family member um, as a parent, legal guardian, sibling, spouse, child, minor in their guardianship, or a grandparent or a child. Um, in the previous meetings, this subcommittee talked about a one-year uh, in Vermont residency requirement, and they did away with that in this particular meeting. So those are the definitions that they're working with now. Um, even though there's no sort of requirement, you know, there's no benchmark to meet, um, when somebody applies, this committee agreed they would have to demonstrate residency in Vermont at the time that they apply as a social equity applicant, and they came up with a pretty extensive list of documentation that seems to me, at least on the surface of it, fairly inclusive. It includes um, you know, everything from a driver's license to tax returns or even an um, affidavit from a leaseholding roommate. So it should be fairly easy for someone to be able to obtain at least most of, and they only have to up, get one of those documents. They should be able to obtain one of those documents. Um, and then they ended with talking about um, what the waiver and fee reductions will look like. And where they seem to be leaning right now is a complete waiver in the first year, 25% um, <clears throat> of the cost in year two, 50 in year three, and 75 in the four, year four, and then full price after that. And where they ended their discussion was really about whether or not, you know, if someone in year two or three was still struggling, because we know that those are the initial years of a business and the highest amount of cost. Um, if they could apply for an additional waiver um, for those years to be able to get their business up and running with the demonstration of how they're working through that. What about the flip side of that? Any consideration, let's say a social equity comes in and is, is doing extremely well financially, um, moving them off the social equity aspect of things to a, a full license fee perspective ahead of that five-year term? or? There was discussion about that, and it's interesting because there's one part of me that feels like, well, that isn't that sort of the point right. of having these. And then there's another part that says, well, then couldn't we then free up whatever would be the license fee that someone would pay and use that license money to help another social sure. equity applicant? So I feel like there's more discussion to be, to be had on that. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> so you said that there is a list of the quote unquote cannabis related offenses? Um, it's not a definitive list. Okay. So they talked about arrest, conviction, uh, misdemeanor, or felony, but there isn't like an extensive, like okay. specifically this possession, that yeah. type of. Okay. So is it mostly like possession charges or is it? No, they, did, they weren't that specific. Okay. About it. I'm wondering, like, you know, a cannabis related offense could be DUI. That's right. Um, and I wonder if that actually is in line with what we're thinking about for social equity. That's right. I, I feel like they're when they're discussing it, the examples that are used are more about possession right. than they are about DUI or sale even. So I think that's a question I could bring up to the subcommittee. Yeah. Yeah, and then on on that, I, I'm curious. Like, there's this been thing in the back of my head, which is someone could qualify as a social equity applicant because of a criminal conviction, but then they might also not qualify for a license because of how we are going to be thinking about criminal history records. Like they had a cannabis conviction, but they also had an aggravated domestic assault and within, you know, a certain, mm -hmm. like, so it could be that they get through as a social equity applicant, but they're ultimately denied a license. Um, is that being discussed at all? I mean, I just don't want that to like come as a shock to anyone, just because so, you have a cannabis conviction. Yeah, no, that hasn't been discussed um, at all. And uh, this committee should probably at least be thinking about that. Right. Um, I think we'll probably think separately about what those um, background checks and the impacts of those are right. and probably other committees, but this committee should have that in mind for sure. Right. They also have not talked about what impacted really means. So someone right. could have a cannabis conviction in their past and have absolutely, I mean, it couldn't, might not impact their, their present day life at all. Um, and we haven't, haven't delved into that. Can you um, talk, was there any like kind of overlay of Vermont with opportunity zones, like just the map of Vermont and, and where these are? Like I think, you know, when we talk, talked, I think, about kind of disproportionately impacted communities because of the, you know, sample sizes in Vermont, it was like entire counties were impacted communities, you know, and I'm wondering if that would be also true of the opportunity zones. So the they did show what the opportunity zones are, and it looks, to me, at least on the census map, that those are smaller, more narrowly impacted spaces. Okay. Um, and if I remember correctly, it's not, it's, it, it has something to do with employment in that area and whether it's changed or dropped, um, and, and that, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, okay. And then, sorry to take up so much time here, but um, can you um, just run through some of the kind of discussion that happened around the residency requirement and because sure. um, I was reading the minutes and it seemed like it was a year, it was two years, then it was zero. And I just don't, I wasn't kind of really in on all of those conversations. Yeah, so there's, um, there's been discussion in other states about residency mm -hmm. requirements and at least the report back to us is that in each of those states that has been struck down in, in some way. Um, when it was challenged by um, by anyone, so there was discussion around that, and I think there's a there's a concern of um, opening the door to Vermonters who live here and have been here and would like to participate in this market and potentially have been impacted by Vermont's criminal and you know justice system, um, and but then not also discriminating against people who might want to move here and be part of this system as well. So. Um, that was the gist of the discussion, and I think um, where the subcommittee began to talk about was almost like weighting some of those things. Like as part of the application process, the Vermont piece of their story could be considered as part of it, although it's not a requirement to apply. So that's sort of the way that they're handling it right now. So just, yeah. Objective criteria is obviously easier to score and weight right. subjective than to have some discretion, which uh, you know is, makes things difficult, but I, I totally agree with the concept. Yeah. It's kind of like the qualitative piece. That's right. Yeah, we heard from Robin about that. Yeah. And we haven't talked about, and I think that the legislation probably assumes that it would be the board that approves those applications, yeah. and whether or not there should be, we should lean on our subcommittees or other groups mm -hmm. to, to help us approve those. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a that last point is a good question about who is actually deciding who's a social equity applicant and whether we need a broader stakeholder group. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Well, there's a lot to tackle there. 
Um, anything that you need from us? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that, you know, it's something that we mentioned in our admin meeting, I think it's a good idea to kind of have um, our consultants, maybe subcommittee member, uh, attend the Social Equity Caucus and talk to them about yes. the progress that they've made yeah, on absolutely. their next Social Equity Caucus meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, market structure. I'll start there and then move to the medical. Um, so on Monday, um, the conversation started with local fees. Um, there was a there was a discussion around what these local fees are actually intended to support. Of course, you know, uh, we as a board need to submit a recommendation about, um, around reasonable fees, and we have to describe um, what they're going to be used for and why they are reasonable. Um, so it was, is this the administrative cost of actually processing paperwork? Is there something more to it than that? Um, is there something else? And the subcommittee decided um, that for now, as a placeholder, they would like to cap this fee at a $100, um, and they would leave that as their recommendation up until they heard from municipalities or from the league or someone else about um, why there's an additional burden that should they would justify an increase to that. So for now, I think that the $100, you know, they did hear from Jen Flanagan um, from VS Strategies, who's a you know, former um, cannabis control commissioner from Massachusetts, and you know, she really thought that the local fees should be low, and, and unless there's a justification, can be adjusted in later years if they if we're finding that there actually is kind of increased repaving or something like that that, that is, is needed. Needed. Um, yeah. I was just going to say I did ask um, Tim our member with expertise in municipal issues yeah. to think about if there. If they want, if, if municipalities want to justify a higher fee, to think about what what that fee would be associated with other than administrative costs. Yeah. So I asked in that in the compliance and enforcement committee meeting um, yesterday to think about in anticipation of that roundtable. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, 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 please do. And this is an open discussion. Speaking of which, can you just mention a little bit about the oh, yeah, roundtable? Sure. Yeah. So, um, based on public comment that we got last time, we reopened the survey and sent it out. We also sent it to the regional planning um, groups so that they could sort of help us get some more response. Um, and we have gotten more response. Um, I think we're almost at 30% of the, the folks that we sent it out to are responding right now, um, which was my goal. So, yay. <laughs> Um, and then, so it, it, stay, it remains open until the 27th at noon, so Monday at noon, and then um, we're hoping to do the round table next week. And the questions I think that we'll probably ask um, are, you know, what do you see as, as the expense above permitting any other business in your town? Um, it would be helpful to know what municipalities are concerned about. Is it traffic? Is it lighting? Is it, what is it that they're worried is gonna cost more potentially? If they are worried, it's gonna cost more. Um, you know, and, and what should we be basing the fee on? Um, it's a little hard to compare, you know, a fee for a cannabis establishment based on other fees if you don't really know, like I don't know what the liquor control fees were based on or how long ago they were created. Right. So um, it's important to know what it is the costs are now for these groups. And then also in terms of compliance and enforcement, what, they're, what, what they need to know from us. Mm -hmm. Um, and then clearing up some confusion. I think that's becoming clear through the survey about what, what does the legislation actually say right. for them. Great, yeah, and so that's next week? Yes, yeah, yeah. great. Okay, um, so the subcommittee market structure then moved away from local fees. Um, there is, again, a discussion about provisional licenses and how these should be structured. So these provisional licenses, of course, are these kind of exploratory licenses that they discussed in the prior meeting, which would only have kind of a short form application. It would allow a kind of applicant to then go out and start thinking about a business plan, start putting together you know, rental agreements, potentially putting together capital, uh, et cetera. And the huge benefit to the board is that we can then gauge kind of entrepreneurial demand, how many license holders are, are serious about this, how many are potential license holders, um, how many retailers are serious, you know, labs, and, you know, product manufacturers, et cetera. 
So the subcommittee thought that the only way that this provisional license could actually add value and be kind of a real barometer of interest is if the fee was not nominal, if it was an actual real, real fee, um, and that it was not refundable. However, it could be applied as a credit to their final license or to a future license. Um, so um, that was kind of the parameters of that, that you know, they said $500 for a small cultivator um, would probably be enough to kind of really separate the folks that um, are only semi-interested from the folks that actually want to get going in year one. Um, so that, I don't think they s set that in stone anywhere, but that was kind of their, their general kind of take on the not, not nominal question. Um, the conversation on Thursday uh, really turned towards the actual fee structure. Um, you know, the VS um, strategies uh, presented um, their basic first shot at a fee structure um, with actual kind of tiers of licenses and what they would cost. Um, you know, that was my first look at it in the meeting. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of assumptions that go into making this and really they're doing what we asked them to do, which is um, look at, um, you know, we have these, need, we have a need to um, uh, have our budgets and our fees equalized. And, uh, but we also have these other considerations that we have, which are having, you know, reduced fees, uh, reducing barriers to entry for small cultivators, having waivable or sliding scale fees for small equity or social equity applicants, and that perhaps, and to also kind of keep this local, keep this, you know, build upon our kind of craft culture in Vermont, and so having kind of these mega grows and just in order to kind of have a, a, a large fee come in is probably not in line with what we're um, trying to do. That being said, you know, they don't know what the entrepreneurial demand is gonna be. They don't know how many people are going to get into this, um, how much of the kind of flowering canopy we need um, can be met by small um, and medium-sized cultivators. And so they've laid it all out here with the, uh, any number of kind of iterations that you know we're gonna need to decide on. Um, I think this market structure fee recommendation is on our website, or at least it can be very soon. Um, and you know, for the members of the public, you can see kind of what they're thinking based on tiers of outdoor and indoor cultivation, um, this, you know, the sizes of those. They've got two different retail licenses, like tiers for those, um, which is just kind of a brick and mortar storefront um, traditional retail, what I think most people think about, but then also a for a lesser fee, just a kind of nursery license or seeds and clones. Um, they've priced out um, what a kind of limited space, um, limited location retail license could be. This is the kind of store within, a cannabis store within a um, larger store, general store potentially. And um, they've they have a fee here for like the kind of retail, pharma retailer, the direct consumer. Um, they've got two manufacturing license types. Um, tier one is the ones that use CO2 extraction. Tier two is the ones that don't. I think there's kind of a increased safety concerns for the kind of tier one versus the tier two. So that, that's why they separated those two out. Um, they've got the integrated license fee here, um, testing laboratory fees. There is a question about whether if you're a lab that's already certified and paying a fee for can hemp, um, whether you need a second certification and pay a second fee just to do high THC cannabis. So I think that's, again, an open question there. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about this is they have it set up here so that Yes, like fees could support our budget, our projected budget, which we don't have fully realized yet. Um, and then one, I think, one where um, they don't have to meet those, where there could be some, um, there could be some supplement, supplemental income from uh, the excise tax, so that we could do kind of more reduced and lower fees for small cultivators and social equity applicants. And of course, 
there's so much that goes into this because they don't know like are we gonna have 100 200 um, you know cultivators coming forward or are we gonna have 50 or are we gonna have 400 a thousand so it's it's kind of you know there it's a little bit of uh, assumptions built upon assumptions here but they have it separated out into kind of best case scenario where there's a lot of participation and a more reasonable um, you know participation and then kind of the look worst case scenario where you know people just want to stay in the illicit market and don't want to participate so it's broken up that way um, the conversation in the subcommittee it, it, there wasn't much back and forth this time because they were really just presenting it and then the conversation is likely to happen on Monday um, yeah I think that's that's kind of wraps up what happened there um, any questions on any of that or do you think in terms of looking at the fees and kind of guesstimating entrep entrepreneurial demand would it be helpful to have like a model of um, like what it would what the total cost is if you're a retailer or a small cultivator and you're trying to start up like is is there is that an estimate that VS can can look at for us I can ask them that you know I I, I can say that I've heard, you know, from various members of the public that are interested in this, that, that they kind of know those numbers already, that they've kind of put together their business plans and, and that they're kind of, you know, just waiting to see what the final, like, regulatory compliance is going to cost, what the kind of mm -hmm. the details of the, of the rules are going to be. But it, it might be helpful to have that, just like maybe Massachusetts, this is how much, like, the average retail like, establishment costs. You know, to start right. up or a lab. The lab is right. somewhat easier to kind of like those are fixed costs. Right. Yeah. I thought it was a good first crack at this, knowing that there's a lot of guesswork that still needs to be done when it comes to entrepreneurial yeah. demand. Um, and they're they're abiding by direction that we've given them, which is fantastic. I had a clarifying question. So the pre-application um, idea would. I remember listening um, to the conversation and I remember it being discussed in the context of small cultivators if we want them to be a large part of this this market and not knowing exactly how many might come forward initially um, to have that pre-application to gauge that part of this would, would you is the subcommittee also considering pre-applications for every other license type that we might put forward to gauge the entire market. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear. I don't have an opinion either way necessarily. But. Yeah, I thought the conversation was have a provisional for every license okay. type. Yeah, to really just see, you know. Gauge the market. Gauge the market and see, you know, make sure that there aren't going to be bottlenecks along the way. Um, right. And, and if there are, at least we'll know initially and we can make adjustments or we can try to make adjustments you know, on the fly if there's not enough testing capacity in the state because of these provisional licenses. Yeah, I know everybody's fearful of, of labs and how many there currently is certified through the Agency of Agriculture's program, how many prospective ones there might be, and I think we need to really pound the pavement to make sure that we've got satisfactory labs right. to, to support this industry. Yeah, and I, one other piece kind of on, on that, like estimating the, the demand, the, the model also has some of these tiered cultivators that are the larger ones, and they, they say that you could delay these, you know, you could delay them if you, these provisional licenses come back and you're well short of the canopy needed to meet the demand, then you could open up a different license, mm -hmm. a, a larger license type. I think what Massachusetts does is, um, you have to graduate into one. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you can start at 6,000 square feet, and if you're successful and you're using your canopy and you know, you're growing quickly, then you could graduate into a 10,000 or 25,000 square foot. You know, that's the kind of, that's, that's the kind of, when you look at this and you see these large numbers, it's kind of, they, they did go into the fact that these might not be available in year one, depending on the demand. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a smart concept and Hopefully we can allow some, some flexibility if, if that license holder is able to prove that to be able to make sure that we're, our supply and demand is equaling it, itself out if somebody's able to produce more. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think essentially for this October 1st report, 
I mean, this is the foundation of it. We need to let the advisory committee kind of do its work and we need to do our work. But um, I think this is a good starting point. Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, I think that it would only benefit Vermonters and everyone if we provide the legislature with a few options on this, not just totally, okay, here's the fee structure to equalize our expenses. But, you know, here, here's, here's another fee structure that could work also that kind of lives the values that are shown in 164 and 62. Um, Sounds like a, a good way to go about it. Yeah. Okay. The medical um, only met once this week. And the discussion, I think, mostly revolved around the patient to caregiver ratio. I think I should, this deserves a little bit of clarity because when people think caregivers, uh, it's actually kind of an umbrella term that encompasses a number of different kind of responsibilities. And um, caregivers under the medical program can administer cannabis to their patients and they can go to a dispensary and purchase on behalf of their patient. Um, but they can also grow on behalf of their patient, grow, you know, grow plants um, under the limits that are in the medical program. And so there's this question about increasing the patient to caregiver ratio, which is currently set at one to one for most, for the vast majority of caregivers. I think if you're under 18, you know, both of your parents could be a caregiver. But for the most part, it's one to one ratio. And you know, there's a lot of conversation about whether this ratio should increase, and of course, I think the two subcommittee members that attended um, really wanted to increase on the administering medicine side um, and, and the kind of traditional caregiver side and not on the increasing the designated grower. Um, leave it there. And you know, the justification um, for leaving the designated grower alone, that ratio one to one, essentially is at what point do regulations come in, at what point do quality control standards come in? If you had one to three, one to five, and all of a sudden, you know, a designated grower is growing kind of a larger plot, um, at what point do we need to have mandatory testing? At what point do we need to have um, all of the compliance and enforcement that is traditional small cultivator that we're contemplating would have to go through? Um, I think it's important to note that almost the vast majority of caregivers have a very personal um, relationship with their patient. It's usually a spouse or a family member. And so when you kind of, that relationship becomes more attenuated, you know, is, you know, at what point do we step in essentially um, and, and demand some sort of regulatory compliance? And so they didn't really come to a conclusion on that. Um, there was just a lot of back and forth about what caregiver means. Should we bifurcate this definition in rule so that there's a caregiver and then a designated grower and they mean different things? And um, I don't think we came to any real, the committee came to any real conclusions at that meeting. They did not meet on Thursday. I think the plan is to meet again on Monday. And we also have to remember that the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, um, which is a legislative committee that oversees the medical program and makes recommendations, is also expiring um, next year. However, the legislature asked for them to kind of restructure their makeup and restructure their mission and give a recommendation to us. And so I think that a medical committee is, is also going to review that recommendation because that's due they want to get it to us by October 1st, the, and then we, we, want to, we have to report back, I think, on November 1st on that. So I think part of that medical subcommittee will be looking at that um, recommendation, looking at the new makeup of the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, see how their enabling legislation may change, and then kind of present that to us as well. Anything on the medical? So our sort of goal is to preserve continuity of the medical program. Right. Leaving it as a one-to-one -one doesn't fe feels more like it would push people from the medical program into the adult use market than preserving the medical program. And I say that because if you are a talented grower and you're now growing for your mother and then your father also gets sick, then you're then you're one of your two you have to choose between your two parents. 
which one you're going to grow for and which one will purchase from the adult use market. So I agree that there is probably a point at which, you know, that crosses from, um, you know, care to small cultivator, but I, I, I think one-to-one just is not realistic or, or fair, and I don't think it, it provides that continuity. I tend to agree with Julie. Um, I think there's a point where the board would have to step in and, and do something when it comes to testing, so on and so forth, but I don't know if leaving it or going anything above one-to-one -one up to a, I, I think that there's a point that we can we can raise that ratio a little bit without um, w still giving me a degree of comfort um, and the integrity of the program without having to leave it at one-to-one. -one. I also think that if it's available, that quality control is something that patients and growers would seek out. If they can go get a product tested, I think that, and it's affordable, I think they would. Yeah. You know, I think most people would. Yeah, I think it's important just to note that this ratio is statutory. Yeah. So we actually, we can make a recommendation around it, okay. but it would have to be approved through the kind of normal legislative process. And I forget exactly which committee this issue goes to. I think it's the public health and welfare, but. Um, um, they've been reluctant to changing this. Um, the human services, yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, notwithstanding, still, right. still yeah. feel. Right, just it's important to note that. Absolutely. Right? And then on the continuity of services, it's, it reminded me that um, the, they've asked, the subcommittee has asked for the dispensaries to provide them with a list of the products that they supply to their patients so that we as a board can ensure that at least those, at a minimum, stay on the shelves, uh, you know, if, to make sure that during this transition that there's no, um, that these medicines are accessible. So I think that's an important piece of this also. Is there a discussion about allowing people with a medical card to purchase at any dispensary or at like an adult use? Yes, use that, that, that's been discussed. Yeah. I think um, I think both of the subcommittee members agree Purchase tax free. I'm sure there's some technical issues you got to work out there, but um, yeah, I think they, that was something they all supported. As far as reciprocity goes, have they tackled that yet? I know that we've got yeah. you know snowbirds, right? And stuff like that, making sure. That so the reciprocity, you know, seemed kind of like a, a no brainer as well. Um, and I know we're cutting into public comment right now, yeah, um, but sorry. we can stay a little bit late. But it did, it did just spark a conversation that had kind of escaped me that the dispensaries actually have pretty strict plant counts uh, currently it's all tied to the number of patients that they have and so if you just say you know anyone with a medical card who happens to be vacation here can go to a dispensary and purchase they may be taking you know the products that are specifically set aside for a specific patient so you'd have to kind of tinker with canopy size and plant counts etc okay um good to know all right, um, if there's nothing else, we'll turn to public comment. And so we have one person in the room, we'll start uh, here, but if you have a public comment and you join through the link, please raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. It's a lot. Uh, oh, sorry. It's just through the camera. Oh, okay, gotcha. My name's uh, Mike Shane. Uh, I'm a minority owner of a recently incorporated uh, Clover Hill Cannabis with my wife, Michelle, who's obviously a woman. and. Uh, also indigenous, so I think that in some ways we fit the bill of what, what Vermont's looking for. Uh, we, I came today uh, to talk about the possible provisional license and what that could do for people in our financial position. We both work full time and we have kids in diapers, so unfortunately Michelle couldn't make it, even though she's going to be the owner operator, so I just came to kind of pre present that view. Um, these small cultivator, we, we, we leased a, a property uh, that we could have a thousand foot canopy and perhaps expand, looking at the law and trying to project in the future because these kinds of businesses can't be stood up overnight. The, the cannabis, uh, especially in the indoor grows, have a lot of unique um, requirements and therefore they can't be stood up overnight. They, uh, they require expensive lights, electrical work, uh, intense amounts of cleaning and sanitation and retrofitting buildings to make it possible. Um, intense security installations. We're going to have to change the windows, the doors. Uh, we're going to have to change the HVAC, everything. All this costs a lot of money. Um, we cobbled together 
25, 30,000 from friends and family and savings. Um, we're going to be about 50 to 75,000 short, just to give you an idea of what it costs to start up one of these places. Um, and without the provisional license or some kind of assurance to the banks, we've gotten almost nowhere. Uh, there's an Efficiency Vermont program for uh, energy improvements, and it's in partnership with BSECU. So we started our Global Hill Cannabis account at BSECU in an attempt to be able to qualify for that program. Uh, we both have impeccable credit. Uh, we're going to buy uh, highly efficient LEDs, um, and we worked closely um, with EVT. Uh, but there's still no answer yet, and I suspect that's because <laughs> we have no license. So. You know, we can put all the business plans together that we want, but I think that the banks uh, want to see a license. Uh, another issue is we're trying to put together futures contracts with some of the integrated license holders or the anticipated integrated license holders that have sort of already made themselves known uh, that they can start purchasing in May. Um, those conversations have been necessarily brief, again, because we don't really have a license. Um, Another issue in Vermont is the lack of commercial property available to folks. Um, we are leasing a property because, frankly, we're terrified we wouldn't be able to find one uh, with the power needs and the security uh, upgradeability, uh, the access to high-speed internet uh, to run the security cameras, uh, and those kinds of things. So basically, we're just burning money on a lease, waiting to hear uh, about some of the requirements and sort of shopping for lights and looking for financing. Um, so really, the licensing fee is the least of our worries when you're talking about uh, you know, a total uh, investment of close to $100,000 just to start. And then the other unique thing about that business is once you flip the lights, you're at least four months away from making any kind of money. Just the life cycle of the plant, just the way that it works. At the same time, the kind of electricity you're pulling out of the wall is thousands of dollars a month. Now our five-year plan has us looking at being carbon neutral, but in order to do that, we have to purpose build a facility, put solar panels on it, and a battery. Certainly the first three years is gonna be at this least place. And so, all that to say, I don't wanna take up all the time, I think I'm getting the wrap-up uh, the wrap up signal here. <laughs> all that to say, this provisional license, uh, I think is, is gonna to touch on everything that you want to see. It's going to touch on social equity because not very many people can just light money on fire waiting for the rules to be written, waiting for it. It's going to touch on efficiency because it's going to allow folks to go out and get efficient lights uh, and try to be more carbon conscious. It's going to, it's going to allow uh, women-owned businesses like my wife and indigenous and, and BIPOC communities to be able to get into this thing and, and have some credibility when they go to the banks and give us just some security because there's a lot of people that are participating in this market right now that are leasing places waiting to hear. And some of them do have black market ties and can make money in the black market to help float uh, along. We're not in that position, we're not that kind of folk, and, and we want to you know, have some sign of kind of security. So we're really advocating for the uh, provisional license. Great. And I'll leave it at that. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Anyone uh, online? Uh, yeah, so first on the list is uh, International House of Green. International House of Green, you can unmute yourself, and if you wouldn't mind just stating your name. Hello, uh, my name is Yerin Plantillas. I am a current uh, LLC owner in Vermont, and one of the things I wanted to touch on is uh, with this week, uh, licenses will also be distributed to labs looking to open up in Vermont. <laughs> This provisional licenses. Yes, it would apply to labs. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Uh, and the other thing that I want to touch on is as a well, as a person impacted by the by the, by the cannabis uh, war, uh, it, financing is very hard to come by. Okay, uh, especially with banks. So, like uh, the the my the person before me spoke. Uh, being able to have at least some sort of grounding from, you know, some backup from Vermont saying, hey, you know, we are, we're considering uh, opening the market, not only that, but we're going to give these people a chance to open up a, 
a store, a lab, a, a, a farm in here. That would uh, give us a big uh, footstep on trying to gain those financial needs. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah, I think it's mutually beneficial for the licensees and for the board. So thank you. Anyone else on public thank you. comment? Yep. Uh, we have Amelia is next. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just want to touch on what I see as growing anti-caregiver and anti-home growth sentiment in both the Symptom Relief Oversight Committee and the Medical Subcommittee recently. Um, something that we haven't really talked about yet in any of these meetings is autonomy. It's no secret really that being chronically ill or disabled is stigmatized in our society. And that comes with a lot of internalized shame surrounding medication. Cannabis is unique in the sense that a patient has total autonomy in deciding everything from product to strain to the person growing their medicine. And that's really important. Uh, the ability to choose gives patients a kind of independence that isn't seen in any other kind of medicine. And a comprehensive caregiver program is essential to that autonomy. And an expanded caregiver program is going to be essential to that autonomy moving forward. Bifurcating the definition of a caregiver, however, directly attacks that autonomy, that, that attacks who can grow your cannabis, where it can be grown, et cetera. Um, and as far as, as far as lab testing <laughs> being a concern for the caregiver patient ratio, there's $400,000 sitting in a medical cannabis fund that is meant to be used to the benefit of patients. And I honestly can't think of a better use for it than subsidizing caregiver testing to provide clean cannabis to patients. Um, the only threat I see that a caregiver-centered program and an increased patient to caregiver ratio poses is directly to the medical dispensary's profits. Um, that's all I had to say. Thanks, Amelia. All right, next we have, and I apologize if I uh, don't pronounce your first name correctly, uh, Cheryl Murray Powell. Yes, hello, how are you all? Um, I've been listening in. My name is Cheryl Murray Powell Esquire. I am a cannabis agricultural and dietary supplement attorney. I've been uh, practicing in this space. I've been an activist uh, legalization expert for a number of years. I'm also the ASTM D37 Committee on Cannabis's uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Chair. So I just wanted to congratulate on you on the discussion that you're having about social equity, um, the objective criteria that you are using to identify equity applicants. Um, I am also the business development manager for Creative Services, Inc., a 45-year-old screening company. And we have recently released a product that actually does equity verification to make sure that these equity licenses actually go to equity um, Equi the, the correct equity applicants um, and so that everything is executed as intended by by legislature. So I would love an opportunity to present to you all on your next meeting about um, social equity, the work that we're doing at ASTM D37 with regards to social equity. But in addition to that, um, creative services screening products specifically around um, equity verification. So thank you for your time. Um, great job, great discussion. And I really love the part about um, impacted family members being included in the definition of who would be eligible for equity. So I would just like to know uh, what would be the best contact or uh, what would be the next steps in making an official presentation. If you could go to our website, we have a little button for public input, and I think that would be the best way it goes to, we all look at those comments. Um, awesome. Yeah. I was actually filling it out at the same oh, time. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that is perfect. I'm just at the comments part of that page, but great job. I mean, definitely on 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 par with what's happening across the country. It's an exci exciting time for the cannabis industry and an exciting time with regards to equity and parity. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Tito Byrne. Tito, feel free to unmute. Hi there. Uh, I definitely have to. Uh, I'm unmuted uh, on my end. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you for hearing me. Um, I just want to second what Amelia was saying. I agree 100%. I 
I feel like patient interests are taking a back seat to preserving profits for the current dispensaries. That, that's just how it feels. Um, also, I have to definitely agree with, uh, with the idea of subsidizing testing. I think it's crucial to preserving and expanding the medical program, uh, as well as guaranteeing success for small growers in the new marketplace. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. Um, that's all for um, virtual hands. Can do phones now. Yeah, so if you've joined by the phone, uh, you dialed in, um, you can make a public comment. Just hit star six to unmute yourself. No one's okay. unmuted. All right, well, I would just remind everyone who's watching, um, we will have our kind of after hours public comment period next Tuesday, the 28th, uh, from 6 to 7 p.m. Physical location will be here in our boardroom. And, um, but, you know, feel free to join the, via the link that will be available on our website. And, you know, I hope to just hear from you. Um, all right, I don't have anything else. Motion to adjourn? Uh, so moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye.